Norman Foster is one of the world's most revered architects and a pioneer of sustainable design. The creative mind behind Hong Kong's HSBC building, Germany's Reichstag, and our very own Bloomberg headquarters in London, he set up Foster & Partners in 1967. That was at the height of the space race, which greatly inspired him and instilled a sense of what he calls planetary awareness. We were, without using the word green, because it didn't exist then, but we were essentially pursuing buildings that were green, that would consume less energy, that would work with nature. In this episode of Leaders with LACWA Goes Green, Lord Foster covers how the pandemic will change things going forward. Buildings for the workplace of a previous model, which recirculate refrigerated stale air, are out of date. They're perfect for recycling as residential. And why he thinks the future is bright for sustainable design. I'm optimistic because there is a greater awareness. Um, uh, and that awareness is, is shared across a huge uh, spectrum of society. Um, but in the end, that uh, it's going to be about younger generations, their awareness and the demands that, that they make. Foster, thank you so much for joining us on Leaders with LACWA. Now, sustainability has really been at the core of everything you've been doing from the very beginning. How has your thinking evolved? Uh, it goes back, I guess, to the 1960s. And, um, and the influences there were, um, were Buckminster Fuller, Operating Manual for Planet Earth. There was Rachel Carson, uh, the uh, awareness of pesticides, so a kind of planetary awareness. And I think that that very much came in the wake of the space missions and uh, images like Earthrise. Um, uh, so in the late 60s, early 70s, we were, without using the word green, because it didn't exist then, but we were essentially pursuing buildings that were green, that would consume less energy that would work with nature, um, uh, issues like recycling uh, of human waste of fertilizer, unbuilt projects and built projects. Um, I think that then at that time we were the outsiders. That's become now far more mainstream. And, um, and perhaps the big difference between then and now is that there have been scientific studies that show the green buildings are actually good for your health. For example, a patient in a room with a view will leave hospital sooner after surgery, will recover more quickly. Studies by the Harvard School of Public Health have discovered that green buildings, uh, you perform better, you're healthier. So, um, so all of those trends have accelerated. So what's your creative process? How much do you think about the science and how much do you think about design? For me, I, I think, and my colleagues, you cannot separate them out. I mean, uh, uh, design is a response to all the generators and the issues that preoccupy us today, quite rightly, of climate change, energy, air quality, those are, those are powerful generators, along with all the other generators. You know, what is the purpose of a building? How do you make those who are going to use it have a better quality of life? What is the purpose of a building? Actually, when you, I don't know how projects come about. If somebody comes to see you and says, actually, I have this project for you, what's your thinking? Do you say, what, you know, what do you want this building well, to be, or do you think this is what I want it to be? Well, if you, no, uh, not the latter. <laughs> if you take the building that you're in, which is a building that, of course, we're all very familiar with, um, uh, first of all, it's a response to its site. It has to fit in. It's a historic part of London. It has layers of, of history, so it has to respect that. Um, it has to work 
for those in Bloomberg who have a job to do, that's generating a building, the needs. Those needs are material, but they're also spiritual. So, you know, it has to lift the spirits. Um, it incorporates works of art, it creates public spaces, gathering spaces. So, you know, it's part of a wider community. And ideally, it should make moves to address issues such as climate change. There are ratings that measure that. They're not perfect, they could be better, but given those ratings, that building has the highest rating in terms of sustainability, which is a result of several design factors. So in, in a nutshell, it's about the, the quality of life in material terms and spiritual terms and historical terms. But Lord Foster, we, you know, we, we talked about how you became an early adopter of sustainability. Why did you stick with it with, when so many other architects actually did not do sustainable buildings throughout the last four decades? Um, maybe it's coming out of background influences. Um, uh, maybe it's a philosophy that's driven myself and my colleagues over, over many decades. And, and perhaps uh, it's an anticipation uh, of, of change, social change, technological change. So buildings that can endure over time and be recycled, they are the ultimate in, in sustainability. And you know, we've seen Georgian terraces, for example, uh, going back in time, have, have proved very, very adaptable in terms of residential, certain times of commercial. And it's worth remembering that that very DNA of London came out of a crisis. That was the Great Fire of London of 1666. It resulted in the DNA of London as we know it today, historically. I mean, fireproof construction, brick construction, um, the London, the Thames embankment and underground public transport and modern sanitation came out of the cholera epidemic in the, in the mid-19th century. That exported to America and New York and the cholera epidemic there resulted in healthier environments, reservoir for clean water, central park. In essence, cities emerge more strongly from crises, from pandemics, uh, from you know, fires, earthquakes. Um, and, um, and if we project forward, then I could see the same uh, cycle emerging post-COVID. So how do you think the pandemic will actually change buildings and change cities? I think those buildings which are healthier buildings, which, uh, which move more air, have a degree of natural ventilation, have contact with nature, those will be in greater demand. At the moment, they're probably very much the, the fringe, progressive individuals. In the case of your building, Mike Bloomberg, but it could be Apple, Steve Jobs, it could be Comcast, uh, Brian Roberts, so industry leaders who anticipate those, the, the, those trends, those buildings, I think, are, again, likely to be far more mainstream because you have younger generations who are more demanding, more informed, um, and, uh, and those changes will ricochet through. So um, buildings for the workplace of a previous model, which recirculate refrigerated stale air are uh, out of date. They're perfect for recycling as residential. Change the facades, natural ventilation, they're shallow, the floor to ceiling heights are quite low. That could also create a more equitable city where you have a richer mix of spaces for living as well as for working and, and leisure. And if you couple that with some of the trends that we've seen in terms of traffic related to changing patterns in the workplace, then you have more space for pedestrians. All of these, all of these trends were there before the pandemic. 
the pandemic has simply magnified and accelerated them as it has done in the past. Up next, Lord Foster on why he's optimistic for the future of sustainable design as a more environmentally conscious generation takes over. In the end, that uh, it's going to be about younger generations, their awareness and the demands that, that they make, uh, which in turn will influence uh, the decision makers. As one of the world's leading architectural firms, Foster & Partners has delivered cutting-edge projects all around the globe. So what challenges do different regions pose when it comes to sustainable design? And what does the future hold for the industry? My conversation with Norman Foster continues on this episode of Leaders with Latwa Goes Green. Do you see a region where actually political leaders or decision makers are much more aware of sustainability for their cities and for their buildings, which make a big difference? And is there a region that could do a lot better? Um, I, I think there is a division between the world that we share and take for granted and those kind of cities and the emerging economies where you still have the exodus from rural areas into cities. And, uh, and there is a relationship between energy, air quality. Um, so, so those, I mean, one in 10, 860 million people do not have access to electrical energy. And there is a very strong co-relationship between infant mortality, life expectancy, quality of life, um, freedom, sexually, politically. Uh, it's no accident that those areas which are deprived of energy are the zones where those qualities are under threat. Afghanistan, Sudan at the moment are the war zones. They're low in terms of the, 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 right at the bottom of the scale of energy. So you could argue that aside from the moral imperative, there are, you know, there are strong, strong reasons to, um, and, and, and clean energy, of course, is at the heart of the whole climate change issue. Yeah. At the moment, renewables are delivering a very, very small proportion of that. We're totally dependent on fossil fuel-based uh, energy. And, um, and an out-of-date transmission system with big power stations. So, uh, so I think we have to, like so many individuals who, who are now with that, you know, leaders like Bill Gates or Elon Musk or Stuart Brand, the whole Earth Catalog in the past, it's not surprising that they're advocates of nuclear energy as the only proven clean source. What is your biggest hope right now? So are you seeing actually more of these kinds of buildings crop up? Is there much more awareness because of the protests that we've had on climate change? Is it the youth that's driving the change? I think that I'm optimistic because there is a greater awareness. Um, uh, and that awareness is, is shared across a huge uh, spectrum of society. Um, but in the end, that... Uh, it's going to be about younger generations, their awareness and the demands that, that they make, uh, which in turn will influence uh, the decision makers. Um, and I think that you know, if, if mobility becomes cleaner, but I, I, you know, I, some of those trends I think do need, uh, do need a degree of challenging and, and questioning. Lord Foster, I'm going to name a couple of, of your babies. I don't know if I'm asking you to choose amongst your children, but you know some of the most recognizable buildings by you, of course, the Millennium Bridge here in London, uh, London City Hall, the Reichstag, and uh, the Great Court British Museum. What was your favorite project to do? Uh, as you say, it's, it's very, very difficult. It's like you know a favorite child. I'd say perhaps the Reichstag does stand out because First of all, it's an energy manifesto. So 
um, so it transformed something that was dependent on fossil fuels. It uses all the technology to produce something which, uh, which is essentially carbon neutral. And as a public building, uh, that's a statement. It's a symbol of a city. It's a symbol of a nation. It incorporates um, works of art. It's recycling an existing building, which, as I mentioned earlier, is the ultimate in, in sustainability. If you can, uh, if you can give a new life to a building, it, it also creates public space at the roof level. It uh, is the most visited parliament in the world, so it puts the the public above the politicians who are answerable to them. And that, of course, was made possible by the politicians. So it's, um, it's a demonstration of democracy in action. And, um, and in that sense, uh, Germany at that time, and in many ways since, has been a, a leader in, mm. uh, in such environmental uh, issues. So uh, I, I, I think that for all those reasons, that as a project does stand out. What about the Millennium Bridge? Um, Millennium Bridge, I think, uh, exceeded our expectations. We did a lot of computer studies with a group called Space Syntax, who uh, were able to anticipate using, uh, using computer predictions, the way in which it might bring prosperity to a poorer area opposite on the opposite bank, the most prosperous uh, area of London. And, um, and that has worked. I mean, it, that now is, uh, uh, you know, can be cross-checked. So uh, more people cross it and it has had a, uh, an equalizing effect on, uh, on a large area of London. Aside from giving you a, uh, a new perspective on the Thames, yeah, I mean, it, it's a pretty spectacular bridge. I, I think at, at first it swayed a little bit. So as an architect, again, how much do some of these projects come to fruition and then you see how people use it and you have to go back and readjust it? I think the, the important thing about that uh, huge embarrassment, um, which took everybody by surprise, everybody involved in the, in the project, but it did... Uh, as a consequence, of course, it had to be retrofitted with, 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 with dampers. Um, it, it changed the codes. So bridges now, with, a, with an awareness of that phenomenon, because um, research showed that those bridges, which had been subject to huge pedestrian flows, but were not designed as pedestrian bridges, did behave like that, but because it was only momentarily, it didn't attract attention. So, uh, so as a bridge specifically designed for large pedestrians, it did change the building codes, and that, of course, is the is the history of buildings. It's a cause and effect. We talked earlier about the Great Fire of London, yeah. changing the DNA of the city and bringing in fireproof construction. When we look at the Georgian Terrace. We don't think, aha, you know, that's a response to fire. Uh, we think it's, you know, it's a very beautiful uh, response to residential. We also don't think about recycling, adaptability, um, but it's all of those things. So it's the lessons of history. Up next, Fostering Partners has drawn criticism for its work on airports, which some environmentalists say should be shunned but Lord Foster thinks more perspective and engagement is needed. Their views who walk away and say, you know, as a moral principle, we're not going to have anything to do with mobility in the form of air travel because it has a carbon footprint. I would argue that everything has a carbon footprint and in relative terms, the carbon footprint of air travel is relatively small.
Foster and Partners hit the headlines at the end of last year when it withdrew from a climate change action group due to disagreement about the firm's work on airport projects. I asked Norman Foster about what happened. Lord Foster, I know there was controversy where, uh, you know, you also built airports that were actually seen as environmentalists, as not sustainable, not, you know, not green friendly. I mean, what was your response to that? Air travel is not the journey of a jet across the sky. The travel mobility in any shape or form is about infrastructure. So the buildings that, uh, that will move people to a train or to an aircraft consume energy. So there's an imperative to reduce the carbon imprint of transportation, of mobility. And our society is about mobility. You have to put this in the, in the, in, in the wider context. I mean, I've instanced the fact that the technology exists to decarbonize the ocean and to cleanly produce the fuel for jet, for jet travel. Jet travel is 2% uh, of travel. The other you know, 15% is mobility in all of its forms. Um, just the production of meat for hamburgers is around 15% in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, so you have to have a sense of perspective about this. And there are those who, you know, I respect their, um, their outlook, their, their views, who walk away and say, you know, as a moral principle, we're not going to have anything to do with mobility in the form of air travel because it has a carbon footprint. I would argue that everything has a carbon footprint. And in relative terms, the carbon footprint of air travel is relatively small. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be addressed. But I do feel passionately that we have to address the infrastructure of mobility. We have to reduce its carbon footprint like everything else. We can't walk away from it. We, we, we can't, you know, uh, adopt a hip hypocritical moral stance. Lord Foster, if you had to choose a building, a project, private or public, no, I mean, uh, money, no object, what would it be? I think it would be a community that was large enough uh, in strategic planning to be able to work with all the factors of energy and waste and circulation to demonstrate that a new urbanity could learn from the past, could be compact, walkable, uh, have a high quality of life, um, an abundance of greenery, that would give shade, um, quality of life, absorb uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, in other words, could learn from the past and could adopt the latest technology. So it would go, go beyond an individual building. And I think that that comes back, I guess, um, you talked about early days of practice, perhaps the biggest change in my outlook, and I believe the colleagues that I, I work with, is that, um, is that the infrastructure of cities is far more important than any one individual building. So, so if I had to uh, you know, identify my dream project, then it would, be, it would be wider than any individual building. It would be a community. Norman Foster, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.